Okay. Well, as I've said to city staff and a number of different uh, correspondence items, that this is clearly a controversial issue. I know uh, the Highway 12 discussion has been a heated one on some occasions. Uh, I would open this up to the council's questions, but I would ask that while there are very legitimate concerns for, you know, either favoring inexpensive energy sources or disfavoring the mode of extracting this energy source. That's not what the conversation is about tonight. The discussion among council members and any other questions that might come forward must necessarily address what is within the city of Moscow's authority. Now, I would say that this city council as individuals or as a collective body is, you know, within its privilege to say anything about any aspect of it, but for the purpose of tonight's discussion, please confine your remarks to the hauling the big loads through Moscow. Wayne. Jim, I just a uh, question on the weight. Now, my understanding was the, the heaviest weights before they were cut down, they were over 500,000 pounds. Was, am I mistaken with that? No, I think there were some. The heaviest one was around 500,000 pounds. The heaviest uh, Conoco Phillips load that came through is around 650,000 pounds, the, the first two that went down U.S. 12. Uh, this is the, that, that weight that I gave you, 165,000, that's the payload. You've still got the weight of the truck and the trailer, which we combined in that total weight. Well, it just seemed like 165,000 was quite a bit less than I would expect because I was looking at the 500,000 for a full-size load. Half load seemed like it would be 250,000, so... Yeah, this is the these are the current ones that they have in uh, Lewiston. They their plan, uh, it, and I don't know what their current plans are uh, at this time, uh, uh, Member Krauss. But we've uh, their plans were for around 200 loads, 200 modules originally to come down US 12. These are the 33 or 34 that are currently there, uh, and this is the information they've given us for permitting is that the heaviest of these when they're cut in half would be this. They may have others that they were still developing to bring bring down the river that they haven't yet that would have been heavier loads if they had uh, done that. Wayne? One, one other question, uh, Jim. The permitting process for the state of Idaho, ITD, now my understanding is that uh, the Montana Highway Department, Montana Department of Transportation, has not issued any permits, and they are, in fact, looking at some litigation through the Missoula County Commissioners. Uh, so my question would be, will Idaho issue any permits before Montana issues the permits? Uh, that's a really good question, and, and what we did on, I can tell you what we did on US-12, which is we did not issue any permits on US-12 until we had confirmation that Montana was going to issue the next permit because they were taking that load uh, into Montana. And if that similar thing is done, then we would need to get a confirmation from Montana. Now, whether that will be done in this case because they're going to haul partway up 95 and then stop on I-90, I uh, they, they might that may not be the case in that area. But for certain, before they can haul all the way across Idaho, uh, they're going to have to have a permit from Montana. One final. Okay. One final question. Then I'll let I know everybody else has a question. <laughs> In your estimation, how long will it take this uh, one of these loads to get from uh, through the Moscow city limits? Uh, somewhere between 13 and 20 minutes to cover the four miles from one end of, of what I'd call the urbanized area, not from necessarily your city limits, but from the urbanized areas from each end, which would be down at the uh, the bridge. Right. Uh, it's south of where we get the five lane because we'll be stopping traffic at that point. They'll, they'll, that's where they'll come back to where they're going to be able to move around them, and they'll be able to run, uh, drive through, uh, their estimation is they'll drive through Moscow about 12 miles an hour. Uh, they're equally as concerned about pedestrian traffic, even at uh, 2 in the morning. And so they'll be uh, going at a very uh, slow pace that uh, through town so that they're able to adjust and, and change as they go. Thank you. Sue? I guess, um, <clears throat> and you were saying that you're not familiar with the Coeur d'Alene end, but I'm just wondering uh, when this load crosses over Northwest Boulevard, how does it make that left-hand turn to get up to I-90? I really couldn't tell you. I could ask my District 1 office. Uh, <laughs> the, it, what we do on that is, you know, that we have our traffic people who look at the areas that we have and then they have theirs. And so we, we all met together and they took their half of the plan back and we took our half. Nobody's approved any plan yet, so I'm sure they'll have to have something in, in mind for how they're going to get around it and in my, Okay, and my other concern is that... Um, 
many times <clears throat> when I've, I've actually been in a situation where the uh, I'm turning left onto a road that the wide load car has gone way ahead and I turn left and go, oh, look at that, <laughs> because I didn't was already pa the the flag car was already passed, and I'm thinking of roads like Zietler Road, mm -hmm. that someone could come out of that, flags gone by, they turn left and there is the behemoth and there's not you don't see that. That's not something you see coming because of the way the curve is. Now, when you're talking about having two pilot cars, <coughs> how close is that? close pilot car so that type of thing doesn't happen because I really they will stagger up to the intersections of those when they're in that uh, traffic control situation like what you have on that stretch from Thorn Creek Road to the uh, South Fork Bridge so you'll have one that stays pretty much with it because we've got all the traffic stop coming in the other direction the other flag or pilot car will then proceed down further out plus you'll have an Idaho State Police vehicle out in front of that car so they'll be able to make sure that no one pulls off as this moves up and approaches each one of those uh, intersections as it travels along. Thank you. This is similar to what we did on US 12, and they that, that worked very nicely for them there in terms of being able to control traffic as they came out so people didn't turn into that into that load. Tim. Oh, thank you, Mayor Cheney. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, we're talking about going through Moscow in the late and evening and early morning hours, and I'm, I'm curious as to whether the St uh, State Department of Transportation thinks that uh, additional policing services will be required from the communities that you're passing through. Um, Whirly. Uh, maybe you don't you don't go to Whirly, but Moscow, um, the potlatch intersection. Are there? Do you anticipate uh, the need for the local law enforcement officials to be on site at a, a heavier presence than they would normally be? And if so, what their duties and responsibilities would be as far as getting these mega loads through through town? Uh, uh, Member Brown, I would anticipate that we'll have the same safety meetings that we held uh, with the loads that went up from Conoco, which at those meetings we invited all the local law enforcement, uh, included all of the local uh, uh, emergency services people, and, and they do those kind of a safety meeting so that they can kind of go over and explain what they're going to do and what their impact would be in their area. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there will be a, a, probably a need for a increased uh, awareness for that. The carrier is required to do all their own traffic control, so they'll be setting up flagging stations, pilot cars. It's up to them to have the advanced vehicles out in front of it to get that done. If there's an increased cost to, the, to a city for providing additional policing services, how are the cities uh, compensated for that? Uh, we didn't we didn't have any requests from the counties or the cities when we went up through uh, on US 12. But certainly at, when we do our safety meeting, uh, the carrier would be responsible for paying the price, uh, you know, to, to cover that cost just as they pay for Idaho State Police to, <coughs> to be with that. If uh, the city of Moscow uh, was called upon to help in some way mm -hmm. with their city uh, police department, uh, they'd, they'd certainly be paid for those costs. At this point, their traffic control plan doesn't, doesn't uh, they don't think they'll, they'll need that. Thank you. Mayor. Just, I just want to follow up on that question. When do you propose to conduct that meeting with law enforcement? I mean, you know, you said you heard about this three weeks ago. I got the email from Representative Trail on uh, March 22nd uh, and then read about it on the front page of the paper the next day. So are we, would we get no notification of the, the, you know, projected date of hauling and our law enforcement be in the loop sometime in advance? As much as we would know about it, you would know about it. Uh, when they actually apply for the permit, it's when they contact our DMV. And the way the permits are issued, as I said before, they're issued for uh, the next two to five days for what that is. So we normally do a pre-meeting, like for a large hall like this, as soon as we get an approved traffic control plan so everybody knows what's being proposed. Then we'd have a pre-meeting with all of the local law enforcement and emergency service providers and then get everybody on board. Uh, 
and answer those questions if they have any others that, that haven't been answered by then. Uh, and then, then we would be, uh, the actual date of the move kind of varies because it depends on <coughs> whether and when they get their permit. Okay, but, but an estimated window of two to five days advance notice, is that what you said? I would hope it would be more than that. Me but too, it's, me too. <laughs> but that's all that's required, Mayor. Okay, thank you. For the permit. Uh, ExxonMobil's been very good about uh, uh, talking about giving us as much lead time as they can. So, Dan? Jim, I, I know you can't speak for your, um, your uh, well, I guess, cohorts in Washington or, or even uh, the ports of Portland or, or Seattle, but uh, is there thought to whether, you know, it, it seems to me just in, as a layman that 195 up to I-90 might be a, a pretty good option for those loads rather than trying to, you know, because it's a, a lot less... Uh, gradient as far as the different uh, grades we'd have to you'd have to do here with steakhouse and crooks hill and and uh marsh hill and even the well even you do still have to do the lewiston grade but that and i don't know if you can speak for them or if that's even been a pro if they've even approached washington department of transportation on the, that point i don't know if they've approached washington dot it would be a longer route to run 195 and then they'd have to take the interstate through spokane area which uh, might be more problematic for them right. uh, due to uh, much higher traffic volumes. Uh, as you'd mentioned, all of the hills like uh, Marsh Hill and, and Crooks Hill and uh, Steakhouse Hill, we, we do have three-lane sections with six-foot shoulders, which would accommodate the load going up through and allowing traffic to uh, pass uh, through those areas. So even though they will be going slower, about 10 miles an hour or so to go up those grades, uh, they would be able to still accomplish that in the in the six-hour period that they're looking at from leaving Lewiston to getting to the District 1, District 2 boundary, which would be roughly the Leita, uh <coughs> Benoit County line. And then the second day, they'd have the seven hours that they'd be then running up to I-90 to that, Mayor. that close section there. I, I, did that answer your question? I think uh, so. And also, so we're looking at one load at a time, you know, once they... They're going to go one load to the Leita County line next day up to the spot on milepost 18 then the next permitted load would be, I mean, that would be the plan. Uh, they could have uh, up to one load on each of the two segments. So they could do a load, uh, say if load uh, one left and it spent the first night there, when it's going on to its next segment up uh, on US 95, this one, the, a second one could leave. from. So one load is on a segment at a time. At one load on a segment at a time, that's all. Mm -hmm. Walter. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I was glad to hear the 12 mile an hour through Moscow because if they can do 30 on the flat, I wouldn't want you to get a speeding ticket out here. <laughs> um, to relate these to what we're used to seeing on the highway, Jim, tell me again, please, the length, width, and height of this uh, entire, including the tractors, uh, module. You said 15, 10 high. I heard that. 200 feet uh, 15 long. feet, 10 inches high, 24 feet wide. And 207 feet 11 inches long. That's the entire. Uh, that's the entire uh, truck, from the tip of the truck to the end of the uh, okay. end of the trailer. And, and to, if, if I may, to try to relate this to, to semis that we see out here, mm -hmm. I believe that interstate overpasses are required to be 17 or 17 and a half feet high. That's correct. So some semis are taller, if not all, than 1510. Is that, is that correct? Right. This isn't a particularly high load because they're cutting these in half. Okay. And your lane width, I know that varies, mm -hmm. but what do you think of as a lane width in your, in your district from Lewiston to the, to the Latow County line? 12, 13, 14? Almost all of our striped lanes between the yellow and the white stripe are, are around 12 feet. In some Good. cases we have 11s, but I think in all of this area that we're talking about for this route, they're all 12 feet. So this is a two-lane two wide rig, uh, effectively. Yes. yes. Okay. And then lengthwise, what is your longest non-tandem semi-truck, semi trailer and, and tractor? I might have to phone a friend on this. Dave, you have <laughs> Dave, are about 70 feet if you long, want to right? speak, please come up to the microphone. Identify yourself for our records, please. 
Yeah, my name is Dave Couch, and I'm the district traffic engineer for ITD. Work for Jim. Um, basically, uh, the standard trucks uh, run a 50, 53 foot trailer, and typically the tractor then is another 18 to 20 feet. So in general, the, you'd see a 53 foot trailer with a 20 foot pull truck in the front of it. You're you're at 73, 75 feet. If you start getting into extra length vehicles, uh, there's some permitting routes that allow them to go up to about 92 feet in total length. But you're, when you see, and I don't know if y'all allow them on 95, but you see them on the interstates where they're pulling two trailers. The doubles? The doubles. What's the length of that rig? Uh, those guys are typically running a 48-foot trailer and then a, probably a 40-foot trailer behind that. And then you got, again, your 20-foot of tractor out in the front. 108? Yeah. So, the yeah, the tandems, okay. or what they call the doubles, can be up to 180. Okay, so this is a 100 feet additional to one of those, Correct. just to get some idea. Correct. So they're long, they're wide, and they're not horribly tall. Yeah. I will, uh, well, since I've Go got the mic, I will well, let Dave, you... have all you like. <laughs> I will let you know that the, these gentlemen... Lean into uh, it, if you would, Dave, so they, that it can hear you. The, okay. These gentlemen have assured us that each, each axle on the trailer has brakes. So um, if, if, you, if you think in terms of a, somebody pulling a camp trailer, a, you know, a 30-foot camp trailer, and they got tandem axles and they got brakes, these guys got brakes on all of their axles. So in, in reality, you know, obviously you don't want to dump things off the load by slamming on the brakes, but they, they should be able to stop in a reasonable amount of time. Also, the, the axles underneath them steer independently. So uh, as it goes around a corner, it can do what they call crab steering. So, you know, even, even though it, it, it corrects for its own off-track, if you will, so as it goes around a tight corner, the, the, the front trailer tires will turn into the curve. The back trailer's tires turn opposite so that the whole thing just swings around, uh, as opposed to a long semi-trailer that, you know, Doesn't. it's a fixed trailer, it, it off-tracks. So. Thank you. And is that what happened, is that, was it a defect in that system that it caused that one rig to get stuck on the Conoco loads, that one that got wedged around the corner for 59 minutes? Is that something like this too? There, I don't believe any of the loads were wedged for 59 minutes. They did rub up against the side of a rock with it, mm. and they wanted to make sure of what they had. It was very, you know, dark, so they, they looked to where it was. The first night they did have some difficulties. Okay. Those are some pretty tight curves. I, I don't believe are. we have any curves no. on this stretch road uh, that we're talking about tonight that would be anywhere as close to that uh, degree of curvature. Thank, thank you, Dave. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Sue? Oh, I guess my question was, I think it was answered. I was wondering if these, um, the trailer is articulated in that it turns in sections. So the crab turning helps, but... The could you repeat that for the record? So the yeah. Well, what he's talking about is that the uh, the trailer itself is, a, is is fixed, just like mm -hmm. the module that's made of steel. It's going to be fixed, mm -hmm. and then underneath it, the axles themselves turn, so that you're able to move the axles to keep the load on. But it will pivot with the trailer, so that you can keep it within the, the within the lane of where it is. But it will. Uh, the, the, there is no center pivot point on the trailer that would uh, on the load itself, the the module uh, that would that would allow it to turn. So it's going to be fixed. Wayne? Just a, kind of a thought that came up, uh, how material it is, I don't know, but I got thinking about trying to back these up if for some reason or other, and it sounds to me like with these steerable axles, I know that if a guy pulling a set of doubles has to back up, he's in trouble. But it sounds like this outfit could probably back up more efficiently than somebody pulling a set of doubles. Uh, absolutely. They can back up with this load if they need to. They can also, uh, uh, if they run an extra truck, they can move it around and use it like a push me, pull me, if you will, and turn around and move it the other direction if they had a problem. Walter? Do they anticipate push me, pull me on any of this load that you're talking about through through here? Uh, the loads are so much lighter that I don't think they would have that, Walter. Tom, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I had a few questions about... Um, I was trying to understand the number of loads. You said there were 30 some loads that are currently in Lewiston that are being cut in half, so the total is 60 something? That's correct. And then, so the 30 is out of the 204 that was originally being proposed? 
the thirty yeah. the thirty four modules that are in Lewiston. Thirty four right are are from uh, subtract that from the two hundred and four. Is that correct? There were two hundred and four original or two hundred or something. Like that? I, I, uh, Councilman Lamar, I I th believe it was around two hundred to two hundred and seven. Okay, it, it varied a little bit. I've heard the. Uh, you know, as they've continued to revise their plans and decide what they're doing, we've heard that that number go up to 211 and drop to 200 and so, something. But I, I think for safety, you know, good estimating basis, 200 is a reasonable number. So, so there's approximately 170 loads that we don't know where they're going yet, right? Is that is that correct? From so 200, 200 and something, take away from that 300 or 34. So for, there's that leaves another 170. Divided in half, cut in and half. And then you cut those in half. If I mean, I don't know if they're all going to be cut in half, but if they are, does that mean that we're going to have another 340 come through after the 30, or after the 60 that we're going to get? So that would be a total of 400. They don't have plans to do that, and so and they haven't shared plans with us to to mm -hmm. cut more in half or to do those kinds of load reductions with it. Uh, their plan is still to propose to run uh, loads on US-12 uh, after these are, are moved uh, up to US-95. So we, so right now they'll be in the, so the ITD is being asked to approve permit. Once they apply for the permits, ITD will be asked to approve those permits for 60-some loads that will come through uh, Highway 95 and then stop at the intersection somewhere close to 95 and and Interstate 90. So, but we don't know what the rest will be. We don't know what that proposal is going to be at this point. And that's what I'm hearing you say. Uh, hopefully what I'm saying, <laughs> and try it again if I didn't get this right, but the 34 that have been shipped down to Lewiston mm -hmm. are the ones that they're talking about cutting in half. Right. Uh, the remainder of them, their original traffic plan for that is to take those on U.S. 12. 